And welcome to At Issue. Thank you, as always, for joining us. I'm H. Wayne Wilson, and we have the pleasure of talking to four state legislators about the upcoming veto session, and more importantly, what might happen in the lame duck session. We'll uh, address those issues, including pensions, which, of course, is at the top of everyone's mind in just a moment. But first, let me introduce to you Senator Dave Kaler. Thank you for joining us, Senator, a Democrat from Peoria. Also joining us, a representative from Galesburg, Don Moffat. Thank you for being here, Don. Thank you, Wayne. Uh, Darren LaHood, a senator from Peoria, thank you for joining us. Thanks, H. And Jahan Gordon Booth. Uh, last time you were here, you were just Jahan Gordon, so I guess you took Derek's last name too and hyphenated. And New and improved. You know. New and improved. <laughs> Jahan, a Democrat from Peoria, thank you for joining us. Thank you. And congratulations to all four of you. You all f uh, had faced election because of redistricting, although I think one or two of you didn't have competition. So congratulations nonetheless. Now the important stuff. Uh, the, the veto session is the last week in November, first week in December. Um, let's first, before we talk about what might come up in that session, let's talk about the makeup of the House and the Senate. It is now extremely heavily Democratic. And I'd like to hear from both sides, but I'll start with you, Dave. Um, you have, in, in the Senate, you have a 35-24 uh, mm -hmm. margin in the House 71-47. Pressure on the Democrats now to perform? Oh, sure. Yeah, there always is. In the, in the Senate, uh, when I first went in, I had a... Uh, Supermajority, 37 members, uh, and this this past uh, uh, session we had uh, uh, 35 members. Uh, so now, uh, come spring session, we'll have 40 members. 40 to 19. Um, now people say, well, that's you know, veto-proof, uh, you know, uh, Senate. Well, but that's presuming that all 40 Democrats would ever get along. So that's that's probably too much to presume. But uh, yes, there's a lot of pressure because uh, we still have to work in a bipartisan way. And I think we can't forget that because that's the best legislation that is produced. And Jahan, 71 to 47 in favor of the Democrats. That's sure. veto proof, yes. uh, not quite as much as the Senate, but pressure. I think that there is always pressure, um, even more so than the fact that we have a supermajority going into January. I think the the pressure that I feel as a as a legislator from Peoria is that there is a desire um, from within and from the community that we need to fix the problems that we have in Illinois. We've uh, taken some strides, but there's a lot more to do, and so the the pressure is definitely there. Um, do I think that the Democrats are going to have to do it all themselves? Um, hopefully, as Senator Kaler already alluded to, that we will have bipartisan support because that is how you're going to, you're going to get the best kind of uh, legislation for the people. Darren Jahan mentioned bipartisan support. What role do the Republicans play in the new mix? Well, I think when it comes to issues of getting our fiscal mess under control in the state of Illinois, I think Republicans will be there to work with the Democrats to do that, whether that's pension reform, whether that's getting our $9 billion deficit reduced, paying our unpaid bills, putting our state on a path to fiscal solvency. I think Senate Republicans will work with Senate Democrats where we can agree on those issues. You know, where that agreement uh, comes in at, I think, is going to be very, very important. But uh, obviously going from 24 to 19, uh, it was a difficult day for the Senate Republicans. But, uh, you know, we have to still uh, stand for the, the principles that, that we believe in, and that's getting our state back on track. I think all of us around here agree on that. But, you know, we have some real issues in this state. I mean, a $9 billion deficit, $90 billion in unfunded liability in our pension system, arguably the worst uh, pension system in the entire country. We've been downgraded for the ninth time in the last three years to have one of the worst credit ratings and about $6 billion in unpaid bills. So we collectively have to address that, and where Senate Republicans can be helpful, we will. We're going to talk about possible solutions to all of what you mentioned, but first I want to hear from Don in terms of you've got about two decades of cooperation behind you. Uh, you're, you're known as a person who can reach across the aisle. The role that you see yourself filling in, in the new House of Representatives? Well, I certainly think it is important that we do work in a bipartisan manner. That's my objective, and, and I think we have the best legislation when it is bipartisan. And I've worked with my colleagues here on the other side you know, on various bills. And, you know, this, this area, this region, a lot of issues really take on a, a regional flavor. It's important to the region, and that's where we can reach across and work together. It's, uh, sometimes it's a down state, so then Democrats and Republicans can join together. But um, frequently, when, when, I, when I have legislation, uh, pretty much when I always have uh, bipartisan support, but 
I'll ask my colleagues here to, to work uh, together, but I think if we all have a chance to have input uh, and, and really work together, I think there's a, a good possibility. And the appropriate committees in the House last year, and I think the Senate did quite a bit of that, where it was a bipartisan effort coming up with deciding what the spending limit was and, 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 and then uh, going from there, the estimate of revenue for two years in a row now in the legislature, in the House especially, the estimate was based, it was a bipartisan estimate and agreed uh, for the final bill, or final uh, estimate that was used, realistic estimate, and, and I think that's when we get the best product, bipartisan. Um, uh, Darren outlined the numbers with uh, the uh, pension situation, uh, we're approaching $90 billion. I can't even get my arms around that number. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm just going to open up to uh, an open discussion here. What can we do? What do you see happening with pension reform? Dave, you want to start us off? Well. <clears throat> the system is not sustainable, so it has to it has to be reformed. Uh, that's clear. Uh, if you look at the uh, abuses and the causes, it goes way back decades. So uh, there, there's not a blame game here going on. Both both parties have been uh, guilty of uh, of missing payments, of you know diverting funds to other projects. Uh, so what what's in front of us right now is how do we go forward and how do we change the system? Uh, and I think there are some ways to do that. Rhode Island has, has done probably the most aggressive uh, form of, of pension reform of any of the states uh, in the country. Uh, and there's some ideas that we need to take a look at. Uh, the, the bottom line for me is, is will, will it be fair? And I think we cannot treat all pensioners uh, in the same way. You've got people at the lower end of the spectrum that need to be protected. Uh, you've got some uh, folks that, uh, that make very good uh, you know, pension uh, money uh, when they retire. Uh, if we need to take excesses, it needs to be out of the top of the system. Uh, I think there needs to be some caps put in place, and uh, um, you know, there's a way we can do this and, and do it right. I've taken the, uh, the the liberty over the past couple of months to really take a look at our pension system um, moving forward. You know, we have an, an unfunded liability, and then we have costs moving forward, and, there, and we have to treat them separately. Um, looking at costs moving forward, a lot of those. Um, a lot of the cost associated with that comes from the compounded cola. And one of the questions with the compounded cola is if a compounded cola was changed, if there were, one, the necessary uh, votes within the legislature um, to pass it, and if, say, Governor Quinn were to pass that, uh, excuse me, sign that piece of legislation, would it stand up to a constitutional objection? Because whatever it is that we pass, we're going to be, uh, we're going to have to go through the courts in order to defend it. Um, so you have that option, but then you also have to look at the fact that um, we have a lot of folks within the system that were getting pension sweeteners over the years, and as uh, my colleague alluded to, they aren't fair. And when we have people within the pension system who are depending upon that pension for just their livelihood, um, I think that we need to have a heart and some compassion. Um, California did pass pension reform last year. Uh, one of the, the gentlemen who was the chairman of that pension system, his name happens to be Michael Lawson. Uh, Mr. Lawson is going to be addressing uh, many of the members of the General Assembly um, during the second week of veto, just to kind of talk about some of the things that uh, that worked in California, some of the things that didn't work. So hopefully we can begin to understand that, you know, yes, this is a real problem, because I think that for many years, members of the legislature just kind of put their head in the sand and really didn't want to touch it, because it's the it's that third rail, and no one wants to deal with it. But hopefully, you know, there is a, there's a stomach for getting something done, as Senator Kaler said, that's fair, but it's equitable because we do have to get this fiscal house in order because right now it's not. Don, that third rail, do you want to touch it? <laughs> <laughs> there, there's no question we have to address pensions. The current system simply is not sustainable. There, there's no question about that. Number one, all parties need to be represented at the table, and, and that's something that hasn't always been, been the case in the past. So uh, through their organizations, through the bodies representing them, so all, all parties, stakeholders. When you say stakeholders, you're talking about unions and... Cur sure, current retirees, current employees. They need to be represented at the table. Those, uh, you know, the, the administration needs to be represented. Every stakeholder needs to group needs to be able to have at least the opportunity to present their idea if they don't like the ones that are being advanced but to just to to float something vote on it doesn't necessarily solve it in fact as representative uh, Gordon has just said probably would be tied up in the courts there's a constitutional question there's a legal question so unless we do it right we haven't solved the problem and then I think those that are already retired I, I hope we can uh, guarantee that they get what they were told they would get. 
teachers retired based on here are the terms, made decisions for when to retire mm -hmm. uh, based on what they were told they would receive. I hope we can keep our word with that. And I hope current employees in the public pension system will get benefits according to what they have paid in this so many years. Suppose they've worked 15 years. I hope there is a pension benefit based on on, on benefits that they were led to believe they would get, thought, felt they were guaranteed. If they need another five, 10, 15 years, then that might be different terms. And I think if we have a plan that maybe gives the participants some options that, that probably would make it more acceptable, that if you want this level of benefit, you're gonna to have to contribute this level of, make this level of contribution. If you only wanna make this level of contribution, the benefits would be different. So a tiered system, I think, needs to be at least part of the debate, part of the discussion. Your suggestions, Darren? Well, um, doing nothing is no longer an option, and that's really what we've been doing. So that is not an option to continue to have our credit rating downgraded and have article after article written about Illinois is, is uh, not acceptable. What worries me is when we talk about having the unions come in to be a part of this, you know, they haven't been for some of the reform. If you think about it, we have two tiers in Illinois right now. We have tier one and tier two, and I'm actually a tier two employee because I came in after January 1st of 11. So if you think about the tier, what created tier two, what does that do? Any public employee that comes in after January 1st of 11 is under a different system. They can't retire at 50 or 55, they have to retire at 67, which is applicable to the private sector. Um, they, they're capped at the amount that they can make in a lifetime under tier two and their match changes under tier two. Everybody agreed is a good thing, puts us on the path to fiscal solvency. When that bill was debated in the legislature before I got there, had bipartisan support, passed, it was signed. But the unions were absolutely opposed to that. Ask me, SEIU, all of them were absolutely opposed to that. So you start from that standpoint of how do you make progress with the unions when something like that was supported bipartisan but was opposed by the unions. So that's, from my point of view, the real difficulty we're going to face with pension reform. And, and let me mention one other thing. In a way, Illinois is an island. We're the only state that hasn't reformed our pension system. Uh, Representative Booth, uh, Gordon Booth talked about California. Dave talked about Rhode Island. New York, a very heavily publicly union, uh, unionized state. They have a six-tiered approach. So instead of tier, two tiers, they have six tiers. There's lots of options out there. We don't have to reinvent the wheel, but we have to have people come forth and say they're, uh, I'm talking about the union, sit down at the table and saying they're willing to do this. Dave? Well, uh, we have started that, and the, the two-tier process was the beginning of pension reform for us. Uh, we need, you know, uh, one of the things that Representative Moffat talked about was uh, having all the stakeholders at the table. I'd like to include the judges in that because uh, the judges have been excluded from uh, any talk of pension reform because uh, it was uh, anticipated that uh, we would have a legal challenge to this and that we didn't want to somehow cloud their judgment on that. I, I tell you, people uh, really sense that that is unfair to uh, exclude anyone uh, of the five pension systems in the state. And so I think we need to have the judges there. Uh, but we need to remember that uh, uh, employees did not miss payments. You know, any employee who came in and worked uh, for the state or worked as a teacher, they did not miss their payments, okay? It's, it's the state that missed the payment. Uh, and it was because, uh, you know, and you can take any time period you want. You can go back uh, five years, you can go back 10 years, back, you can go back, back to Edgar, 30 back years. to Thompson. Yeah. Uh, and, and there were, you know, it wasn't that, that money was taken out of the system, it's just that the full payment wasn't made. Um, so I, I think that uh, we, have to, we have to look that, uh, at what is fair. That's, I think, the, the, the best litmus test of, of any pension form we do, and that is, is it a fair system? It has to be sustainable. We all agree on that. But also, is it fair? Age, I, I don't mean to say that I think we absolutely will get an agreement, but I think that should be the objective. We should work for an agreed bill. And if we don't, at least all the stakeholders have a chance to offer their alternative, their option. And, and I just want them to have, at least have a chance. And then go forward, just like when we debate a bill, we don't, uh, we don't necessarily get a unanimous vote when we vote on issues in the legislature, but everyone has a chance to speak and present their thoughts. Uh, is, is it safe to assume that this will not be resolved in the veto session? No. I, I don't think it'll be resolved in the veto session. It'll, it'll uh, either come up uh, in January during the lame duck session or it'll uh, start anew when we have the, the new legislature sworn in. L let me turn to gaming and Don, I'd like to start with you because this is a difficult vote for you. Uh, there was a expansion for gaming. Governor Quinn vetoed it uh, based upon uh, his doubts as to how well it could be policed. Mm -hmm. The problem that you faced was that you traditionally have been against expansion of gambling, but 
a lot of money was included for things that are very dear to you, 4-H, county fairs, soil and water conservation, et cetera. What's the prospect of overriding the veto in the veto session? H, from, from what I'm hearing, this is not worth taking a hard uh, head count. Um, I think it's, you, you want odds on that? <laughs> is that what you're saying? I don't, can we talk about playing odds in public television? I don't know if we can do That's that. Good <laughs> I think uh, right now I, I would be surprised if there's an override. And, and let me say that the governor has a legitimate concern, a legitimate issue. There. Let's do make sure the safeguards are in place. Let's make sure that there's proper regulation, proper policing. I want that. I have generally not been in support of expanded gaming. However, uh, there are also programs that I have always supported, such as you mentioned some on uh, 4-H, extension, soil and water, county fairs, uh, forestry programs, uh, harness horse racing, uh, capital improvements at the state fair. This included a $46 million package to fund those things in agriculture. And of course, agriculture is our number one industry in the state of Illinois. So that's the dilemma that it created, things that I had, you know, I had not supported in the past, but yet uh, so it was going to be revenue for some, some programs that I feel are important. And that's, that's why I did vote for it. I, I think it's unlikely that there'll be an override of the current bill. Um, might be, but, but then we could start out fresh. Let's address the concerns that the governor has presented. They were, they're legitimate concerns. And there still should be the revenue stream that, that has been identified. Do, do you see a new bill as the alternative, Darren? Uh, well, I voted against the, the bill when it's come up a couple times. I think um, I think we could see some movement in the veto, but it more, more likely will come back as a new bill in the next session. And you know, from my perspective, I voted against it because you know, really, this is a massive expansion of gambling. And, you know, this is to bring revenue into the state. And I think if we had a $9 billion surplus instead of a $9 billion deficit, we wouldn't even be thinking about gambling. And this is really a massive expansion of gambling. Five new casinos, slot machines at the racetrack, slot machines in the airports. And, you know, I know there's some good things in there, but, you know, um, you know from my perspective, this is a lot of false promises in terms of what the gambling bill uh, is, is authored or what, what it's proposed to do. And I give the governor credit. He stuck to his guns on it. He believes this is too much of gambling in the state. Uh, he's concerned about Chicago regulating their own casino, which would happen within the bill that's structured right now. So I think there's some real problems with that. And, uh, you know, so I, I commend the governor on vetoing it. Well, we have to understand what's driving this whole movement though and that is that the Chicago wants a casino um, and and at some point they're going to have a casino uh, the the bill was put together with with that uh, primarily in mind and I understand that because uh, if you go to Chicago and you see the conventions uh, there at the hotels they line up the buses and they take everybody over to Indiana to, to gamble and then they come back uh, so there's a lot of revenue that's le leaving the city now in order to pass something like that you have to uh, uh, give somebody else some some reason to vote for it um, uh, there was only one uh, gaming bill that I did not support and that was because uh, it really threatened the paradise uh, I mean I, I make no bones about uh, trying to protect the paradise because that's you know Peoria's uh, uh, East Peoria's uh, boat uh, they're an excellent employer they're a good business uh, uh, they're very uh, philanthropic in terms of what they do in this community and that's worth protecting um, in the new bill, uh, which I voted for, uh, it allowed uh, uh, casinos, uh, which are river boats now, to uh, build land-based uh, facilities. Um, I have every reason to believe that, uh, that if this were, were law, that uh, we'd see a, a land-based casino here uh, in East Peoria, which would uh, create hundreds uh, of, of construction jobs and uh, maybe even more uh, permanent jobs. So I, I see it as a jobs-producing bill as well. Let me turn to Jahan and talk about another topic, and that is DCFS. There was uh, proposed cuts for DCFS uh, in funding. And that was to be made up by closing some prisons, TAMS, one of them, and that would introduce new money to DCFS. Uh, of course, we're not closing the prisons, at least right now we're not. And DCFS leadership said we'd have to drop about 375 positions. What's the status of that right now? We're still at a bit, at a bit of an impasse. Uh, DCFS did not lay off um, many of the workers that they had discussed, that they had, you know, um, talked about laying off and that's that's a good thing but I think that we're going to have to do um, going into next session we're going to have to take a really long hard look at what's going on within the agency of DCFS um, in talking with the chairwoman of the um, Department of Human Services Appropriation Committee her name happens to be Sarah Feigenholz um, 
throughout the past couple of months, there has been much discussion about the things that are happening with DCFS on the administrative side. And then, you know, being here uh, in the Peoria community, you hear about things that are happening within people's homes. And it is very alarming. So, you know, going into this next site, uh, going into this next um, budget cycle, it is going to be important for us not just to balance a budget, but to balance a budget in the right way so that people and families that are at their most vulnerable have an opportunity to live life with dignity. And you've, this has been very close to you, Dave. Well, yeah, and, and you know, I met with uh, some of the staff and, and more importantly, some of the uh, law enforcement in Tazewell County uh, several months ago, and uh, the the law enforcement folks wanted me to understand that uh, simply laying off people and uh, um, you know not having the the capability of DCFS to really investigate and do what they needed to do wasn't going to eliminate the problem it was just going to transfer it to be a police problem and uh, I think we've seen that uh, there was an unfortunate situation uh, uh, that happened this summer where you know down in Granite City a, a father killed his two-year-old uh, son because he wouldn't eat breakfast. Well, that's, that is a father that shouldn't have a child in that, in that home. I mean, that's what DCFS does is it protects uh, the most vulnerable, our children, from parents who can't handle being parent. I mean, there's obviously some other problems there, but when, when uh, that kind of thing happens, uh, that shows you the, that it does. It becomes now a, a police matter, it becomes a coroner's matter. And this was all over the possibility of closing the Taswell office. Well, that's, yeah, and they, they, had, they had already identified who was going to be laid off. Uh, now, uh, as you know, Representative Gordon Booth said, that uh, fortunately that we haven't had those layoffs. Uh, our time is slipping away very quickly, and I have two topics I want to get to real quickly. Uh, one is the Illinois business climate. Now, I'm going to address this to Don first. Um, we, we hear a lot of discussion about workers' comp and tort reform, et cetera. In your estimation, what would be the first step that you would like to see in terms of improving business climate in Illinois? I've been keeping an unofficial, unscientific poll just when I talked to businesses, ones that were considering expanding or are or, or here now and building a plant in another state, um, and just ask them, what, what could we do to cause you to, to build in Illinois? And the number one item that's men mentioned is the permitting process when they go to build a new plant here. The other things you mentioned, workers' comp, cost of doing business here, uh, the fiscal condition of the state, those are all occasionally mentioned. But I was recently talking to an agricultural uh, supplier seed company that has uh, some plants in Illinois and then in our neighboring states. And I just said, you know, when are you going to put, put another one in Illinois? And they said, we're not going to. And I said, why not, thinking they would mention things like workers' comp, uh, cost of doing business here. And they said the permitting process. What? We can go to another state and put a plant similar to ones we have, a footprint similar. And it'll take weeks or months. In Illinois, it'll take years. The cost is, is the delay. So this was part of the problem with losing the fertilizer plant right. to Iowa? Right. Well, well it, no, it, was not, it wasn't a problem. It was an issue. And, and, and when we met, uh, and Senator LaHood uh, was in some of those meetings, when we met with the uh, company representatives, they said, we want a guarantee of how long the permitting process is going to take. So that is, uh, I, I think Representative Moffat has, has hit you know, the nail on the head here. Darren? Well, in terms of our business climate, you know, I've been pretty vocal about this. I mean, you look at Caterpillar, the largest private sector employer in the state of Illinois, about 22,000 workers. And last February, when they were thinking about building their next plant, moving back from Japan and where to put that, and Illinois, Peoria competed for that. Uh, we all around this table wanted that here. Galesburg competed for it. And where did they go? Athens, Georgia. And, you know, you talk to the people at Caterpillar, and what do they tell you? You can give us the land, you can give us the infrastructure, you can give us the incentives, and it's going to be more effective to go somewhere else because of our current climate in Illinois. The last five plants built domestically in the United States by Caterpillar have not been in Illinois. Two in Texas, one in Arkansas, one in South Carolina, and the most recent one in Georgia. To me, that crystallizes that issue. Can you imagine if we had those five plants in Illinois? And the reason is workers' compensation costs, taxes, the labor costs here in Illinois. And you, you talk to the folks at Caterpillar. If Caterpillar, Caterpillar has been around 80, 90 years, if they could start their company anywhere, it wouldn't be in Peoria, Illinois. Same with John Deere and ADM, and that's a problem. Government isn't going to create jobs, but we create the climate for private sector growth. And that's what we really need to focus on is, is changing that psyche in Springfield to make private sector flourish and grow in Illinois. Although there is, there was one important point though when uh, Roscom, uh, the fertilizer plant, an announced that they were going to Iowa. Um, the uh, CEO of the company said that it was not 
business climate that they made their decision on. That he said uh, actually there was uh, a lot of things in Illinois that they were very interested in. Uh, you know, that we were competing against a, a, a county that was uh, uh, FEMA eligible for some special bonding that we couldn't compete with because we just didn't have that. But uh, I think that one of the, the main things we can do is engage in, the in business 15 community. Seconds. Yeah. Well, we can engage the business community to participate more with us. And in fact, uh, President, uh, Senate President John Cullerton has a bill in which talks about revamping the whole uh, Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity to include uh, business uh, folks on a, a board that would uh, begin to, to direct that. I wanted to talk about uh, concealed carry because there were 10 counties that passed a concealed carry, uh, but there was non-binding. And so because it was non-binding, we won't talk about it. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> to, thank you to Senator, uh, Senators Dave Kaler and Darren LaHood. Thank you to Representatives Don Moffat and Jahan Gordon thank Booth. You. And uh, we will not be here next week. We will be uh, listening to music from that was taped high atop the Peoria Heights Tower. So join us next week for some music from on top of the tower in Peoria Heights. And we'll be back in a couple of weeks with more at issue. Thanks for being with us.